Welcome to the Medical Menemis Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. With us today is Dr. Barbara Oakley, renowned professor, author, and creator of the most popular online course in the world, Learning How to Learn. And today, she's going to teach us how to learn, sharing tips and pitfalls for us in the medical and healthcare realms. Barb, how are you today? I'm doing pretty dandy, although it's a little bit chilly here in Michigan. I could use some of the chill right now. In Florida, it's still hot and sweaty, even though it's winter. (laughs) (laughs) So could you give a brief introduction? I mean, I'm sure a lot of the audience already probably knows you, and a lot of people have taken your course, as I did. But for those that might not be aware, can you give a brief introduction about who you are and, and what you do? So I'm a professor of engineering at Oakland University in Michigan, and I come from a a little bit of a spotty past in that I originally, as a young person, hated math and science. And so I trained as a linguist in the uh, U.S. Army. I learned Russian. And then I realized that, wait a minute, learning is the same I mean, there's the same underlying processes, although I didn't realize it at the time, in learning language and also in learning math and science. But at any rate, I learned how to learn and how not to learn. And after I was successful in learning Russian, I decided to try and go back to the university at age 26 and see if I could retrain my brain to learn math. And Obviously, I was successful since I'm now a professor of engineering, but if, if I'd known then what I know now about effective learning, I could have really made it a lot easier on myself. And I think some of the really important ideas for us to, to be aware of in learning is that it's not just that you're, that you're learning something, you're not just memorizing when you're learning. And you're not just remembering facts, even though that's a very important part of what you're doing when you're in medical school. There's more to learning, and it isn't like it's a tremendously complex subject, but there are some basic facts that can be, I think, very, very helpful for people to understand above and beyond how to simply get ideas into long-term memory. Actually, as uh, someone that was previously tested and um, diagnosed with dyslexia because of some working memory issues and how the board exams seem to every year get more and more complex, more and more information you need to hold in your working memory at one time. And that theoretically, and, and what I've heard from some other educators, is that that is really weeding out people with poor working memories, not with necessarily knowledge deficiencies? The challenge for people with a poor working memory is that, of course, it's hard to hold a lot of information in your head at one time. But what this means is that you you can compete with a person with a, a very good working memory. You just have to work harder to place information in long term memory. So You can kind of think of your working memory as being like this attentional octopus. So it's in your, mostly in your prefrontal cortex. And when you focus your attention on something, it can make connections either to information that's right in front of you on the page or to sets of links that you've created in long-term memory. Those sets of links in long-term memory are sort of like algorithms or subroutines. They've already been planted there. They can do a lot of the mental processing for you. So all you have to do is kind of reach out there and then tap into that, that set of links. For example, when you're first learning to back up a car, your working memory is going crazy. It's got all this information. But once you've created that subroutine, that sort of set of links of how you back up a car, all you have to do is think, oh, I want to back up a car. And your attentional octopus reaches and grabs that set of links. So when you're learning in medicine, for example, you may not be able to hold a lot of information in mind, 
But if you practiced, you've created some sort of subroutines that you can reach out to and make connections with, with your, your working memory, and you can still do very well. In fact, in some ways, you can do better. Research has shown that those with poor working memories are not only often more creative, but they're often able to make elegant simplifications that the person with a really good working memory simply cannot see because they don't have any need to. I mean, if you think back to some of your worst instructors ever, your worst professors, they often were individuals who had very good working memories. And they'd say things like, well, see, then you do this, you do this, this, and that connects with this and this is, and and they've got it all in their really good working memory and you're lost. So oftentimes an instructor who doesn't have as good a working memory will be able to find simplifications to be able to kind of make everything fit more easily into your own limited working memory. And you can understand things in a, um, actually a simpler and more elegant way. Okay. So it sounds like it will take more time for those with poor working memory. And that can be quite frustrating at times, especially if you see your peers passing you by very quickly. What are some things that you can look forward to or, or ways to mitigate that or just have to suck it up until you catch up to your peers? That's a very good question. So for me, I'm not sure if this, this may be more helpful for those who are looking to get into medical school. But I remember one time, I, I mean, I studied my backside off, I worked really hard. And that was the way I could keep up with those with very good working memories. And one time I studied and I did every single practice problem in the entire that entire chapter so i was prepared and i went in and i took the test and i i failed every single question there were like 10 questions on it and i got every single one wrong and i you know of course i was i was really distraught and that first time ever i went into the professor and i actually started crying and you know he he looked like he was a robot it was like oh really And it turned out that what he assumed that you knew was that you had to assume a 0.7 volt drop across a diode. He assumed that you knew that. And probably two-thirds of the students in the class had old tests, so they knew that's what you were supposed to do. And the other third, like me, had just worked really hard, and uh, and we just, he had never taught that. It was not in the book up to that point. It was just, it was knowledge that you couldn't know unless you saw the old tests. And it was at that point that I suddenly, to my amazement, realized that, you know, a big part of the reason that I'm not doing as well as many of the people who I obviously, I, I know the material better than they did because they'd come and ask me to explain things to them. And, and, but the reason I wasn't doing as well was simply because I didn't look at old tests. So I began to realize that, you know, that, that's a huge part of the learning, you know, continuum is, you know, whether you like it or not, Professors do not like you to look at old tests because it makes their job harder. They have to make up more questions. But a lot of times what professors are doing is they're just grabbing from, let's say that when they were grad students, 40 years before, they had a test and they'll grab a question from that that has a really different set of nomenclatures and assumptions and so forth, and they'll put it on the test. And there's actually, it's very difficult for you to do well on that kind of question, you know, unless you've seen it before. And um, the only way to see it before is to see the old tests. So I do highly recommend things like Course Hero and so forth, you know, to look at old tests and look at materials because the more practice you get with the material you're actually going to see from that professor, 
the better you're going to be able to match wits with them on testing. Yeah, that is extremely frustrating. I know a few professors, mostly in undergrad, but actually no, a few in med school too, that would just copy questions from old question banks or other textbooks or something that we weren't actually using in the course. So it wasn't relevant to the material that we're covering in in the course. And that's fine if you're already an expert in the material and you know how to synthesize it in a different way. But when you're just starting off with new material, (laughs) there's really no way you're going to get that right. Oh, that's so true. So I know I've heard from many other educators and and actually uh, Anthony Mativier that we were just discussing before beginning the interview, one of the recommendations is going to ask your professors for old exams, old quizzes. But my experience, yeah, like you said, not many are going to share that. Some will, but most, if they're making their own questions and not just stealing them from other sources, that's a lot of extra work they have to do to basically make an entire another version or two of the test so that you don't see duplicates, basically. Oh, yes. it's So that means a good thing to do is to make lots of friends in your discipline so that you can either, ha- you know, find someone who's taken it the the semester before or you know or again something like course hero where you can find the old plenty of older versions of of the materials i've never actually used that i'll have to look into it and and definitely add that to the show notes here so the audience can check it out as well yes so in your opinion and i know you have some experience now with uh with the medical students the issues that we can come across, what are some of the greatest pitfalls that you've noticed and and that we can potentially learn from? Well, I've watched our older daughter has gone through medical school and she's just finishing her residency at at Stanford. So we're we're really happy. And she came from a, a small medical school that had just gotten its accreditation. So it does say that it's possible to go to the bigger leaks, even if you're coming from a a less renowned background. But watching her through the years, one thing that I, that she started moving more towards, and I think that really helped her to be successful, because she has done very well on, on the boards and the testing and so forth, is that she started moving her study the beginnings of her study for any kind of major exam out quite a bit, like six months, eight months, something like that. And she'd begin her studies. So she'd be, uh, you know, just kind of adding along with uh, the usual regimen, she would be preparing. And I think what people often don't realize is that every time you have a focused learning session, Your actual learning, a lot of it takes place when you go to sleep that night, as in if you think of learning as the set of neural connections that are forming. So they begin to form when you're focusing, but when you go to sleep at night, that's when the dendritic spines really begin to emerge and make, and to strengthen. So the more you're able to study, you know, a brief session, on maybe an hour or something on a material, but make sure, and then sleep that night and then kind of do that repeatedly, you're able to build really strong, a strong neural architecture. The more you wait until, you know, the last weeks or the last month or so coming up, it makes it much more difficult to create a strong neural architecture because you don't have very many evenings of sleep, you know, to help consolidate and build and strengthen those neural connections about the many different patterns that you're learning. I remember seeing some interesting visuals about that from your Learning How to Learn course, and I found it surprising just how how much evidence there seemed to be for that aspect. I know there's a lot of theory before about sleep affecting your memory and forming you know, neuronal changes, but it, it seemed like it was a lot more solidified than I had previously believed. And I can definitely see the benefit of proper sleep schedule even more so than other health benefits just for your memory. And, and I'm also, I'm curious if that seems to apply to other forms of naps, meditations, anything along those lines as well. 
I don't know about meditation, but naps naps are definitely beneficial in giving you a little break from your learning and and potentially that's where some formation can go. You don't want to have a life of naps. You still want to have some kind of longer period of sleep, uh, preferably during the night. But naps are definitely beneficial. Now, one thing to be aware of, so there's two sort of anti-correlated networks that are in the brain. One is the, that that's affiliated with focusing and the other that's affiliated with more relaxed, what I call diffuse thinking, but it's really the default mode network. And we always used to think that learning only took place when you're focusing. So when you're, when you're in focus mode, task positive networks, as psychologists would say. But there's plenty of evidence now that uh, learning continues to take place in fact, that w- that's when it consolidates and strengthens your knowledge and kind of makes sense of everything when you are in the default mode. So when you're relaxing and ostensibly not focusing on anything. So learning often involves going back and forth between these two modes. And that's why something like the Pomodoro technique, where you focus intently for 25 minutes, then take a break for 5-10 minutes, can be really good because it it allows your brain to kind of reflect on what it's just assimilated. But if you're, so interestingly, the two different, there are two different kinds of meditation that seem to kind of emulate the two different modes of thinking. So there are focused mode types of meditation, such as mantra meditation, and then there are open monitoring types of meditation such as mindfulness, which still starts with a little focus, but gets more into diffuse kind of thinking. And as it turns out, let's say that you're a medical school student and you are focus, 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 focus almost all the time. And then when you take a break, you do focus meditation. Interestingly, there's some evidence that too much of this can actually suppress the, your um, default mode network. So it, that can actually make it a little harder for you to think more creatively, it, it possibly. Although it all kind of depends a bit on you, because if you're one of those really super anxious people, sometimes... <laughs> Focusing can actually bring you out of that anxiety mode. And so it can make you more creative just because you're not so anxious. So it's all a very interesting area. Wow. I never heard that uh, too much meditation could be bad for, for certain types of lines of thinking. That's Yeah, that's really interesting. It sounds like we still need to learn a lot about that in, in specific areas of learning. I know that uh, I had trained both in mindfulness and transcendental meditations in the past and was always wondering what was potentially better for this activity or that activity. But I'm guessing that the the science is still kind of out on that at this point. Oh, yeah. It's interesting to notice some of the different things, but there aren't firm conclusions that can be brought. I would say that, you know, if you're focusing all the time in your medical school studies, for example, perhaps mindfulness might be a little bit of a better approach for you, just at least during this time in your life where you're focusing so much anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that was kind of the conclusion I got from reading um, Altered Trait as well from Daniel Goldman and I forget the other author, very popular, uh, very important in the meditation sciences from what I gather. But Okay, then... First off, I'm really glad to hear that my naps could potentially be beneficial, or at the very least, I can still use it as an excuse because I do like a, a siesta once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does seem to be um, beneficial, so I, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and then what are some of the things that, that we do frequently as medical students that, or higher education students in general you've heard about that are really detrimental to our studies and our long-term memories? Well, probably overuse of drugs. No, <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> um, you know, 
I think most medical school students, they're, they're really doing the best they can. I think one, you know, this would only apply to a certain group of medical school students, but I think it's, it's interesting for us all to reflect on this, and that is that some medical school students, I mean, we know that there's memory techniques that can make it easier to, to memorize things, and, but some people naturally have better memories. They just do. And there's some evidence, there's genetics involved in this. And so us ordinary people look at these easy memorizers and kind of go, oh, why can't I do that? But there's trade-offs involved. Because sometimes these super memorizers, they'll do super well. They'll, you know, they take the anatomy tests. They don't have to really study much before the test. They can maybe a few hours before, they just breeze over and they can remember all the, the terms. And so they kind of get into this habit sometimes of they can just cram at the last minute and it, it sticks and it works. And then something comes up like cardiac function, where it's not that you're just sitting around memorizing a bunch of terms. You have to be able to visualize and understand, you know, almost feel what's flowing where and why and how. And so they'll get up, you know, four hours before the test, they do their usual cram, and you can't do that kind, you can't create that kind of understanding at the last minute like that. So all of a sudden, their grades are, they have been high, 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 boom, and they just dive bomb because they are, they're just not really prepared for the very different kind of studying that is necessary for some materials where the person with, you, you know, a more usual memory is used to, oh, well, I've got to spend time with this. And then when they hit this kind of material, it's the same old thing. So they're, they've given themselves more time to prepare properly, and then they can do better. So when both of my parents said growing up that I have a terrible memory, and them saying that, that was possibly a signal that uh, I got some of that genetic aspect from, from both of them. <laughs> it is. It, it's funny. I often find that engineers become engineers because they say they don't have good memories. And in engineering, the nice thing about it is you sort of look at an initial problem layout but the problem, or you'll devise how to set up a problem, but the problem almost whispers to you what to do next. It's not like you have to memorize a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, some people do, but a lot, it just kind of, it's like, oh, well, we've got this. Well, then you just, oh, solve for this. Well, rearrange this. And it, so once you have the initial setup, it's more obvious without a good memory of what you need to be doing. So I think a lot of engineers gravitate towards engineering as opposed to medicine because they feel they don't have a good memory. Hmm. And I like the visualization aspect you mentioned as uh, when I used to tutor, I tutored a little bit in, in medical school and a little for psychology, but especially for certain medical classes like anatomy, I would tell them to try to visualize all of the muscle groups and everything in relation to each other, sort of like watching an animated video is how I picture it, but obviously everyone's going to visualize it a little different. I found that very useful, at least uh, you know for a few weeks or months afterwards, to really put things in a, a mental 3D model in your head that you can zoom in, zoom out, go through one layer into a deeper layer. And if you can do that, it can be very beneficial. But it's interesting to see that might also work for some other materials and, and other degrees. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me in engineering, I like to visualize. I just do. And so sometimes I'll spend hours coming up with some visualization for something. and But then when I'm presented with a problem, I can go bing, boom, bam. It's easy to solve it because you see what's going on instead of just sort of artificially, plastically man manipulating equations. And of course, even Euler's beautiful equation is actually 
you can visualize it so easily. And once you can, it's, you know, it's a snap. <laughs> That's great. All right. I know that uh, you're short on time today and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I was wondering if we can finish up by a few more rapid fire questions. And I call this a walk down memory lane. So would you like to take a walk with me? Okay. Uh Oh, my memory is going to be tested. (laughs) Actually, it's well, let's go over the first question is, is there anything you wish you could remember better? Oh, probably everything. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I I often really, I work hard at names, and I am definitely better than I was, for example, 15 years ago, which is is a pretty good thing. But I like to remember key ideas from books I've read, and I wish I could do that better. I do use the recall technique, which is to look away from the page and then see if I can remember a key idea. That's found to be incredibly effective for helping people learn. One thing that people do is they often, they will see something in front of them on the page. It is in their working memory, and that fools them into thinking it's in their long-term memory. And only by looking away can you see, do I really have this? Or is it just sitting there elusively in my working memory and fooling me that I actually have it? That fallacy of competence, I I run into that all the time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Also, is there, looking back now, is there anything you would have changed about how you trained or, or your schooling as far as, yeah, just how you would have approached it? Well, far earlier on, I would have started making friends and getting older tests. I think that's the major thing I would have changed because I work so hard. And if you have a test, if you're confronted with tests that have, that really aren't created from the materials you've studied with, it's hard to show that you actually really know what's going on. Good point. Good point. In your career now, or even your side gigs, like online courses, being an author, is there anything you would have approached differently in those aspects? Oh, I just feel so grateful and lucky, actually, that, I mean, part of it was this willingness to take risks and do something that that I felt was going to be helpful for others, even though my, I remember my husband, who's uh, my partner in, in crime, so to speak, um, I remember us looking at each other in the basement when we did the Learning How to Learn course. And, and you know, he was saying, you know, is anybody even ever really going to look at this? And we, we, just, we just thought, I mean, it was an enormous amount of work. It was like six months of pretty much 14 hours a day just pouring into this with no no idea whether even anybody was ever going to do anything or, or watch it. And then all of a sudden, you know, it turns into the largest, most popular MOOC in the world, Massive Open Online Course. We had no idea. So I don't know as I'd do anything different just because I feel very grateful and lucky that you know, that people have found these strategies and ideas and approaches so worthwhile. And so many people have. That's The numbers speak very clearly. And I think you blow me out of the water on that one. I created an online medical micro course and probably poured hundreds of hours into that for, came out to be like four hours of actual video lectures in the end of it. But you spent a lot more time on, on that course than I did, for sure. It's a, it's a task. It's really a task, and especially when you don't know what you're doing at the beginning. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of learning curves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are there any final resources that you would recommend to uh, current or student hopefuls? Well, there's uh, the Learning How to Learn course on Coursera, uh, which is free. You can always just select not to get the uh, certificate and... Uh, There's actually a version now that's brand new for younger individuals, but it also has some very interesting animations that are not on the adult learning how to learn that that show the connections, uh, you know, that give you a better sense of what's happening when you're creating a chunk, a neural chunk. So there's 
lots, well, Terry Sanowski, who is my co-instructor, and I wrote a book. Uh, Terry is the Francis Crick professor at the Salk Institute, and he's one of 12 living human beings who's simultaneously a fellow of National Academy of Sciences, of Medicine, and of Engineering. Wow. So it's hard to believe somebody that smart is also such a, a just such a wonderful guy, and he's so fun to be around, and he's always yeah, he's just really funny. So, um, but anyway, he and I wrote a book on a called "Learning How to Learn," and it's ostensibly for younger people. But uh, everyone I've that's read it has told me that they've gotten a lot of information about how your brain actually learns. And then, there, of course, there's the original book, Mind for Numbers, which all the coursework and so forth is based on. That's sold like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies around the world. Jeez. So it's a really popular book. And that's uh, a Mind for Numbers? Yes. yes. Yeah. We'll put the links of that in the show as well. And I uh, I kind of want to do the kids' courses myself. They sound <laughs> sound fun. <laughs> I think you'll like it. I, I do. And it, it, it's afterwards, you, it, it all seems so easy that afterwards you go, oh, oh I, this was so easy. I knew this, but you didn't know it at all. Yeah, uh, didn't have the language I mean, for it. Yes, yep. And uh, you just sort of, and you certainly couldn't picture it. Like there's some wonderful animation. So anyway. I'm definitely keeping those on my uh, future when I have kids list of materials to, to show them. <laughs> Oh, great. Well, Dr. Oakley, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such an informative interview, and, and I just know that the audience is going to get so much from this. I want to really thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, well, Chase, it's my pleasure. You're doing great work in a really important area because I don't think there's any more difficult area of study at all than medicine. So, I salute you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. you. Have a good day. Okay, you too. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated. 